Howdy folks. I'm Napoleon Bonaparte. Welcome to Historical Impact, Private Lives. Today I've been invited to tell y'all the story of an emperor who thought he was an emperor, acted like an emperor, and folks loved and accepted him as their emperor. But he wasn't an emperor. And he ended up dying poor, yet respected and loved. Stick around till the end. This story is short, but trust me, y'all gonna like it. Today we're gonna talk about Emperor Norton I, the imaginary emperor of the United States of America. His name was Joshua Abraham Norton, and this fella ended up becoming the first and only emperor of the North American nation. Though his origins are uncertain, it's clear he didn't have no royal connections. He was born in 1829 in England, and it's believed he spent most of his childhood and youth in South Africa. In 1849, at the age of 20, he inherited 40,000 bucks from his old man and decided to head on over to San Francisco in the good old US of A. In the following years, he dabbled in business, did pretty darn well for himself, made a small fortune, then lost it all, ended up bankrupt and hightailed it out of San Francisco. Nine months later, he came back to the city, showing signs of being a bit loopy. Old Buddy Norton was mentally disturbed. On September 17, 1859, he decked himself out in navy finery, slapped on a beaver hat adorned with a peacock feather, and sauntered over to the offices of the San Francisco Bulletin, demanding they publish his self-proclamation as Emperor of the United States of America on the front page. And here's what the published decree said. At the request and by the urgent desire of a great majority of the citizens of the United States of America, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of the Bay of Algoa in the Cape of Good Hope and now of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself emperor of this nation. By the authority so invested in me, I order the representatives of the different states of the union to convene an assembly in the concert hall of this city on the first day of February next, where alterations to the laws currently existing in the state of the union will be made to alleviate the woes under which the country is laboring and thus justify the confidence that exists both in this country and abroad in our stability and integrity. When he said our, he was referring to himself. Likewise, he assumed the role of protector of Mexico, stating, Given the Mexicans' inability to govern their own affairs, they needed Emperor Norton to guide their lives. The newspaper editor decided to publish that note with a humorous tone, and thus, the self-proclaimed Emperor Norton I began his imaginary reign. Overnight, he became a very popular figure throughout the city of San Francisco. What's most surprising is that all the citizens of that city decided to play along and agree with what he said. Although he lacked real political power, in practical terms, Norton I maintained a life of a true emperor. The court was established in an old apartment building for rent. Norton spent his days strolling around the city, behaving with all solemnity, responding to bows from his subjects, ensuring that everything worked correctly, that the streets were clean, public property was in good condition, and everything was duly monitored by police officers. Every Sunday, he visited a different church to prevent conflicts between them. Over time, the inhabitants of San Francisco got used to Norton, and some even came to love and venerate him. For his part, Norton, who barely had any money, led a very simple life. However, half seriously, half jokingly, his subjects generously accepted to support him. They invited him to dine at the finest restaurants, he had a reserved box at all the theaters, many businesses added plaques in his honor, claiming to have imperial approval which became a guarantee of prosperity. When Norton I entered the opera, all attendees stood up and remained silent until he sat down. An example of that power, at this point conferred by the inhabitants of that city, was what happened with the Central Pacific Company. This train company refused to invite Norton to dine in one of their cars, so Emperor Norton wasted no time in proclaiming an edict dissolving them. Such bad publicity from this episode caused the company to publicly apologize to Norton, and to make amends, they gifted him a lifetime pass. Something similar happened with the First National Bank. The story goes like this. It seems the emperor had issued currency in different denominations, $5, $10, $20, Norton dollars. But the thing is, this currency was accepted everywhere. On one occasion, Norton went to the First National Bank to exchange $100, and they refused the transaction, as expected, 
but this prompted Norton to issue a new proclamation against the bank, and they had to apologize. At one point, the county mayor declared the validity of Emperor Norton bills, and they became a kind of local currency, even exchangeable for real dollars. This was only authorized for Norton, of course, but that wasn't the only gesture the city council had for Norton. Over time, Norton's uniform deteriorated, so the council approved a grant to buy Emperor Norton a new uniform, and they even gave the green light to a sort of Norton tax of 50 cents weekly for city businesses and $3 weekly for banks. As a token of appreciation, Emperor Norton I bestowed nobiliary titles upon the members of the council. His decrees were received with joy. Newspapers competed amongst themselves to publish them. There was even a newspaper that published fake edicts, purportedly from Norton, meaning they weren't actually issued by Norton, to boost their sales, which Norton disapproved of. One of his measures, taken a week after proclaiming himself emperor, was to decide to remove the President of the United States and dissolve Congress. Upon realizing that Congress wasn't disappearing, Norton decided to allow its existence. Over the years, Norton continued to introduce new decrees, which were repeatedly published by the city's newspapers. He ordered both Catholic and Protestant churches to crown him as emperor. He dissolved the Democratic and Republican parties. He proposed the creation of a League of Nations. He issued imperial bonds. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, he called for a sort of peace meeting that no one attended, but even though it all seemed like the behavior of a madman, and the city's inhabitants appreciated him, no one could deny that Norton was a fair and honest man, which earned him the affection and admiration of those he considered his subjects. In 1867, Alton Barbie, a young police officer, mistook him for a vagrant on the street and arrested Norton. Local newspapers reported on this incident, leading to outrage among the neighbors. Patrick Crilly, who was the chief of the local police, released him and immediately issued a formal apology on behalf of the city's police department. On January 8, 1880, Norton I died in the middle of the street, a victim of a stroke. The entire city mourned his death, and although he passed away in the utmost poverty, the members of the Pacific Club, a local businessmen's association, funded a very honorable funeral attended by over 30,000 people. One of the obituaries in a city newspaper explains why San Francisco came to love Norton I so much. It says, Emperor Norton didn't kill anyone, didn't steal from anyone, didn't seize anyone's homeland. The same cannot be said for most of his colleagues. Dear friends, we know this short story may seem like a humorous tale, and the first thing that may come to mind is to say, it's unbelievable. But believe me, it's a true historical fact. It inspires us to share some reflections with you. And you know, rather than giving conclusions or opinions, we leave that to each of you. But let's try some questions to stimulate the surprise that this story provokes. The easiest conclusion, I believe, would be to attribute this to a story of someone who wasn't in their right mind, insane, or however you want to characterize it. But is this the only conclusion we can reach? Beyond the unconsciousness of assuming roles or functions, what value does it have in this story that Norton not only believed himself to be something he wasn't, but why did the people who knew him, the inhabitants of San Francisco at that time, rally behind this cause? Were they all crazy? Were they all ignorant? Were the businessmen, city authorities, bankers, police, were they all out of their minds? Did Norton have such power that he could induce a collective insanity? Perhaps the explanation lies in the last note published by the newspaper as an obituary. Emperor Norton was a good person. He had no malicious intentions. And surely this, along with the amiability with which he treated people, became the main reason, even knowing that the self-proclaimed emperor wasn't really one. I wonder, weren't there so many characters in history, and many who exist to this day, who have indeed been a source of evil and have led entire peoples, entire nations, to the most deplorable misfortunes? Are there no people in our days who manipulate others solely to benefit their own interests? Have there not existed, exist, and unfortunately will continue to exist delusional individuals disguised as respectable and serious people who meticulously and strategically plan to do harm, and others who on a smaller scale only dedicate their lives to themselves, caring little or nothing about others. We won't deny here that Joshua Norton had problems. We're not defending madness. 
or are we? Perhaps how it's understood and, in any case, what consequences it brings. Maybe you're not clear-headed enough to decide, if you haven't already, to subscribe to this channel, where we tell stories and strive to provoke reflection. Think? New. Surely this is a great madness. What do you think? Thank you for joining us once again on Historical Impact, Private Lives. Napoleon Bonaparte bids you farewell.